So last week we talked about the uh, distribution of the land to the tribes and uh, we talked about Dan and their inheritance and what they did. We went to the book of Judges and saw the rest of the story on Dan and, and we pick up there in chapter 20 tonight and um, uh, we're going to revisit uh, the uh, cities of the Levites and the sanctuary cities tonight. So it says, The Lord also spake unto Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, I'll Point out for you cities of refuge, where have I spake unto you by the hand of Moses. So if we were to go back to Exodus chapter 21, we would be reminded that verse 13 says, Not what I wanted it to say. Yeah. And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. And so this is for the manslayer. This was the first time that, that Moses brings this up. Um, and then he's going to give more instruction there. So these are the cities of refuge. There's going to be three on each side of the river. So he says uh, that the slayer, now that's a manslayer. Now, we had a conversation Sunday in the kitchen uh, because I, I mentioned that the Bible says thou shalt not kill. And so, so we were having a conversation about the difference between murder and manslaughter and all that. Well, that, this, this is the Old Testament answer to that. And by the way, it's actually, a pretty good, it's actually a pretty good way to handle this. So the slayer that killeth any person unawares and unwittingly may flee thither. And they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. And, and you know how it is. Uh, uh, you, we, we see it all the time. You need to hear both sides of the story. When you only hear one side of the story, uh, things get really bad. <clears throat> and lots of times, you know, somebody uh, hears part of a story. They get very emotional. They get very upset, especially when a loved one is dead. And they want blood. They want revenge. And so the, the whole point here is to calm things down and to deal with the situation, get to the bottom of it, to find out if it was accidental or intentional, okay? And so verse 4 says, And when he that doth flee unto one of those cities shall stand at the entry of the gate of the city, and shall declare his cause in the ears of the elders of that city, they shall take him into the city unto them, and give him a place that he may dwell among them. And I think, I think most people, when they think about the cities of refuge, they just think, you know, any criminal can just go there and they're going to harbor these criminals. Uh, that's what sanctuary cities have become in our day, like Albuquerque, New Mexico. By the way, over 240 murders in Chicago this last week, over almost 100 in New York City over the weekend, 98 murders. This is what happens when you defund the police, when you open up the prisons and turn everybody loose, when you refuse to, uh, to punish crime. San Francisco in 2014 passed a law that said they wouldn't punish misdemeanors of theft under $900. It's taken people a little while to figure it out, but they got it figured out. You just go to the shop and rob it. You walk in, you fill your basket, and you just walk out the door and you don't pay them. So Target, Walgreens have... Uh, uh, to, well, Walgreens is actually talking about moving some of their locations or closing some of theirs. Target has changed their hours in San Francisco. How many Targets are there in the United States? Don't know, don't care. But there's four in San Francisco that now their hours are from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Those Targets, they open 10 o'clock probably, 9 o'clock, something like that. They're closing at 6 p.m. Why? Criminals. Theft. They can't, they can't stay open because they just rob them blind. Because the city won't try a case of theft under $900. Not worth it, their time. That's not what the refuge cities are. They are a place of justice. But in order to get to the bottom of the case, uh, verse 5 says, If the avenger of blood pursue after him, then they shall not deliver the slayer up into his hand, because he smote his neighbor unwittingly and hated him not before time. And he shall dwell in that city until he stand before the congregation for judgment. So this is like, uh, just like any situation. This is, you're innocent until proven guilty. And we're going to harbor you so that you are not uh, uh, killed before the time of the trial. And he says, until the death of the high priest, that shall be in those days. Then shall the slayer return and come into his own city and unto his own house and to the city from whence he fled. One of the, the great, incredible, awesome realities of this is the shadow. 
the shadow that's cast here. Now our high priest is Jesus. And is he going to die? Never. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. So when we flee to Jesus for refuge, well, we have refuge eternally because our high priest isn't going to die. So it says in verse 7, They appointed Kadesh in Galilee and Mount Naphtali, and Shechem in Mount Ephraim, and Kirjath Arba, which is Hebron, in the mountain of Judah. So these are the western cities. And on the other side, Jordan, by Jericho eastward, they assigned Bezer in the wilderness upon the plain out of the tribe of Reuben, and Ramoth in Gilead out of the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan out of the tribe of Manasseh. So they're kind of they're scattered out which, on both sides of the river, which makes sense. Uh, that, that way there's access from pretty much anywhere in the country. If you're in the far southern part, well, you're going to flee to that city, the far northern part. If you're in the middle part of the country, you're going you're to go to that city, whichever side of the river you happen to be on. These were the cities appointed for all the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourneth among them, that whosoever killeth any person at unawares might flee thither and not die by the hand of the avenger of blood until he stood before the congregation. Please notice it says both times until he stands before the congregation. There is going to be a trial. There is going to be an investigation. And so um, in, verse, in chapter 21 they go on and it says, Then came near the heads of the fathers of the Levites unto Eleazar the priest and unto Joshua the son of Nun and unto the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel. And they spake unto them at Shiloh in the land of Canaan saying, the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses to give us cities to dwell in with the suburbs thereof for our cattle. And the children of Israel gave unto the Levites out of their inheritance at the commandment of the Lord these cities and their suburbs. And so it's going to begin to list these cities there. But <clears throat> what you're going to find is, is that six of these 48 cities are the cities of refuge. So the Levites are going to live in the cities of refuge. And so let's go back and let's, let's, let's refresh our memories on this. Let's go back first to Numbers chapter 35. So in Exodus it gets brought up. In Numbers chapter 35, uh, there's going to be some more information on these cities. So it says there, Numbers 35 verse 1, The Lord spake unto Moses in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, Command the children of Israel that they give unto the Levites of the inheritance of their possessions, cities to dwell in. And you should give also unto the Levites suburbs for the cities round about them. And the cities shall they have to dwell in, and the suburbs of them shall be for their cattle, and for their goods, and for all their beasts. And the suburbs of the cities which ye shall give unto the Levites shall reach from the wall of the city, and outward a thousand cubits round about. And ye shall measure from without the city on the east side 2,000 cubits, and on the south side 2,000 cubits, on the west side 2,000, and on the north side 2,000 cubits. And the city shall be in the midst. This shall be to them the suburbs of the cities. And among the cities which ye shall give unto the Levites, there shall be six cities for refuge, which ye shall appoint for the manslayer, that he may flee thither. And to them ye shall add forty and two cities. So 48 total cities, six of them being the cities of refuge, the Levites are allowed to live in these cities and they get the surrounding areas for their flocks and their herds. So, so they're going to have, uh, they're, they're not going to be huge cattlemen, but they're going to have milk cow and they're going to have some butcher calves and some lambs and whatnot. And those are going to be for their own personal sacrifices for their families and uh, also for their food. And so they're going to have these as well as all the offerings that are going to come into them. And remember, the Levites are going to take turns at, at the temple. So, you know, they're, they're not going to be there all year long. So they're going to live off of the sacrifices of the people that come in while they're serving there. When they go home, well, they're going to have their own, their own cattle and, and whatnot uh, for their own family. So verse 7 says, So all the cities which you shall give to the Levites shall be forty and eight cities. Them shall you give with their suburbs. Uh, and the cities which ye shall give shall be of the possession of the children of Israel. From them that have many, ye shall give many. From them that have few, you shall give few. Every one shall give of his cities unto the Levites, according to his inheritance which he inheriteth. Now that's interesting. So, so this is going to be up to the people. They, they, and you can see it in Joshua. They, they distribute the land first. The very last thing they do is distribute these cities to the Levites. So once the people already have their inheritance, then... They all come together and they say, okay now, 
now give cities to the Levites. So they're going to do this out of their possessions. Uh, it says in verse... Uh, uh, okay, now let's go to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 19. Deuteronomy 19... And verse 1, it says, When the Lord thy God hath cut off the nations whose land the Lord thy God giveth thee, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their cities and their houses, thou shalt separate three cities for thee in the midst of thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. Thou shalt prepare thee away, and divide the coast of thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to inherit, into three parts, that every slayer may flee thither. And this is the case of the slayer, which shall flee thither, that he may live. Whoso killeth his neighbor ignorantly, whom he hated not in time past. So we talked about this when we studied Deuteronomy, but just as a refresher, the difference between murder and a manslayer has to do with motive, and it has to do with intent. And, and to this day, these are the things that a court of law, a good court of law, has got to get down to. Was there a problem between these two people beforehand? And this is the investigation that's, that's going to go back. If there was... That forms motive, and if there's motive, well, that leads to murder rather than manslaughter. Manslaughter is like almost what happened to me today. So I almost got manslaughtered today. So I'm driving in my pickup, and I'm minding my own business on the South Loop, which I would say is one of the most dangerous places in San Angelo. The reason being because the city of San Angelo will not put up signs which tell who has to yield. So in my mind, the people on the loop have the right of way and the people coming on from those three or four on-ramps should yield. Is that right or wrong? I mean, that's the way my mind works. Well, they don't do it. So there's one at Ben Ficklin, there's one at Chickenbacher, there's one at College Hills, and there's one at southwest and the one at southwest is real quick and then whoosh, and then you zip off there toward target behind target and academy right and so i do my best to i don't think i should have to hit my brakes why should i have to hit my brakes i'm in the i'm in the go-go lane i'm in the loop right and i'm go-go and i'm in the right lane so the people who are going faster than me can pass me and these guys are merging onto onto traffic and when you merge you yield but they don't yield and so here they come, you know, and it's like this. And they don't look either. You can just tell there's this, they're not looking. And you're like, he ain't looking. He ain't looking. And so then it's like, do I do this thing? Or do I, do I hit my brakes and let him in front of me? Or do I just, just stay put? We'll just let the insurance company sort it out, right? And so, so most of the time, if I can, well, I get into the other lane, you know. So you get in the other lane, and here they go, zoom, boy, here they come right in there. And they never even look, never even look, right? And I'm going, how do these people survive? I mean, <sighs> every day. So I'm going along. I scoot over. They come on. I find my spot. I get out of the way. Whoa, you know, because I'm driving 65 miles an hour, which is the speed limit, right? And I'm, I'm doing my best just to survive, okay? I'm not trying to be aggressive. I'm not having road rage. I'm just, this is called San Angelo survival at 3 o'clock on a, Wednesday afternoon. And so I'm driving along and I'm looking in my mirrors, you know, and here comes this, you know, this gigantic super duty giant pickup that's never pulled a trailer in its life. Whoa! 100 miles an hour. 100 miles an hour. I guarantee you, just, boom, I can feel it. Just, boom, do me like this, you know. And on this side here, they're coming on, you know. And, I'm, and, I, and so I get right there at that very last exit before you go around the, the, the deal. And by the way, once a week, those guardrails are tore all to pieces. I don't even know why they mess with putting them up. Once a week, at least, every time I come by there, they're torn all to pieces. So I'm going along, and here comes this four-door sedan from the 1970s or something. Boiling black smoke out of this thing. Tinted windows. I can see it coming behind me. And he whoops into the left lane. Well, I stay put. This big, gigantic, super-duty whatever, you know, that blew me off the road. Well, he's turning right at this exit right at the same you know what's so amazing most of the time you pull up at the light at exactly the same time as these people young people please learn this lesson by the way when you have pipes and you go wrong it doesn't do any good for anybody at all but whatever so here I am <clears throat> I'm doing my best to survive 
this pickup, you know, he blows me off the, the road, and he's, he's way past me, you know, he gets in my lane, and he exits to go by Academy, and I'm going, okay, and so here comes this, this you know, sedan with pieces falling off of it, and I check my mirror because they've also southwest traffic is coming on right here at the same time and they're not looking you know here they come well just just like this that's why the guardrails torn all to pieces no signs no rules i want to talk to a cop who has the right i don't think cops in this town have the right of way they're like whoever's fastest and biggest that's who wins so so I, I i get right here and i mean the exit is right there and i'm not exiting i'm coming on around the circle right this car I don't know how they didn't hit me. I, I honest inch, maybe. Right here, right in front of me. Boom! I hit my brakes, and I mean, I'm just... Aah! When y'all go around there, you see those black marks. That's me. I'm running 65 miles an hour. I lock her down to 35 from here to that, you know, anti-lock brakes, boy. Both feet. Aah! And he just... Around that. And... Oh, good gang. I keep going around the deal. I'm like, I think, anyway, that's manslaughter because I don't even know that guy, all right? We don't have any beef, but now when I meet him, it will be murder, see? Can you see the difference, right? So, so because you tried to kill me in the past, now we have a, a history. Anyway, so sorry I had to indulge myself with that and y'all had to endure it, but Anyway, the, the, the difference is that you've got to determine if there was beef, if there was a problem beforehand. And, you know, I, I just can't, I can't... <sighs> Foolishness like a capital insurrection, a capital riot, an insurrection, a, a, a seven-member, six-member, whatever, capital uh, house subcommittee, an impeachment, all of these things... We are making a travesty out of our law, co law court system in this country. And, and one of the things that's so absolutely important is, number one, you are innocent until proven guilty. That's one of the things that you see with the city of refuge. You flee there and let everybody cool off before we make any decisions. You don't make rash emotional decisions. Number two, an investigation must be made. So it says there, uh, <clears throat> verse 4, this is the case of the slayer which shall flee thither that he may live. Whoso killeth his neighbor ignorantly whom he hated not in time past as when a man goeth into the wood with his neighbor to hew wood and his hand fetcheth the stroke with the axe to cut down a tree and the head slippeth from the helve and lighteth upon his neighbor that he die. He shall flee into one of those cities and live lest the avenger of blood pursue the slayer while his heart is hot and overtake him because the way is long and slay him whereas he was not worthy of death. Inasmuch as he hateth him not in time past. Wherefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt separate three cities for thee. And if the Lord thy God enlarge thy coast, as he has sworn unto thy fathers, to give all the land which he promised to give unto thy fathers, if thou shalt keep all these commandments to do them, which I command thee this day, to love the Lord thy God, to walk ever in his ways, then thou shalt add three cities more for thee beside these three. That innocent blood be not shed in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and so blood be upon thee. But if any man hate his neighbor and lie in wait for him and rise up against him and smite him mortally that he die and fleeth into one of these cities, then the elders of the city shall send and fetch him thence and deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die. Thine eyes shall not pity him, but thou shalt put away the guilt of innocent blood from Israel that it may go well with thee. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Yeah. So, so th this, is, this is the way this lays out. Now, the only way they can determine that is by investigation. They have to investigate the situation. So they take the man who is uh, fleeing, the man who is guilty of killing somebody. They put him in the city, and he is protected from the slayer, from the, the, the uh, avenger of blood, but he is also held in custody in that city. So he can't run away. He's got to stay put or else there is an APB warrant out for him to, to apprehend him. Okay? So, so it works both ways. By the way, remember, no prisons, no jails in Israel. There's no jails. They, they, they don't do that in Israel. 
this city of refuge, it is a refuge to him, but it is also his probationary area until a court can be held. So where's the court held? It's held in the city gate. It's held by the elders of the city. And when you have Levites living in these cities, that means that these Levites are going to be a large portion of the elders that are in these cities. The Levites are supposed to be a group of highly trained biblical scholars. They're supposed to be the guys who teach the Bible. Uh, and that's another reason why these Levitical cities are scattered everywhere. So, a couple problems in our day. One, bleeding hearts who don't want to punish violent crime. That is a, that is a problem. Uh, you are seeing that in these sanctuary cities. Uh, you're seeing that in places like Chicago, places like New York, places like Detroit, places like Atlanta, your places like Seattle. You're seeing that where they refuse to prosecute violent crime. That is a problem. It is also a problem to punish uh, a manslayer uh, like a murderer. That would not be a good thing. An accidental death is one thing, uh, but an intentional murder is something else. So uh, the fellow from Eden who intentionally and with malice murdered two sheriff's deputies should be punished to the full extent of the law, which in Texas is a death penalty. That's real simple. Uh, should not cost us very much at all to figure that out. It will cost tens of thousands of dollars to, to carry through with all that. But that, that's what should happen. You're wrong to say we don't need a death penalty. That's wrong biblically. You are also wrong to say that a manslayer should be treated like a murderer. Okay? And so that's the whole point. Let's go back, by the way, real quick, just so that you... Um, you know where biblically I'm coming from. Genesis chapter 9. When Noah got off the boat. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6. The Bible tells us, Who shows, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. And so, so this is capital punishment for sin. So, a lot of people, you know, they have a, they, they'd like to say, well, the Bible says thou shalt not kill, therefore we shouldn't have the capital punishment. That's not the same thing. Thou shalt not kill means thou shalt not murder. And also, you shouldn't take the law vigilante style into your own hands. You should use the government system of law, wherever it is that you live, you should go through the proper channels. But... When you do go through the proper channels, first of all, you need judges who are honest and just and fair and fear God who will listen to the case, hear both sides, dig deep and investigate and try to get to the bottom and find out what happened. And one of the main things is, is, is there, you know, was this done intentionally? Did this person intentionally hate this person and want to kill them? Or was this a work accident or a car accident or something that, you know, was there negligence involved? You know, by the way, manslaughter has all kinds of different levels as well. You know, if that guy was, was drunk who ran me off the road and killed me, he didn't kill me, but I, I died. I died. Like, if I got nine lives, I lost two of them this afternoon. Oh, anyway, so... So, you, you know, you've got all of these levels of this, and that's fine. I, I, I'm, I understand all of that, that you should look very carefully at all that. But the main, the main reason for these refuge cities is, is to make sure that justice is done. So it's not, you kill somebody, you go there, you hide out, and you get away with it. That's not it at all. Because if you murder somebody and you go there, they're going to investigate. The elders of the city are going to be held responsible to carry out... Uh, capital punishment upon the murderer if that's found to be the case. So I, I, I find it, you know, I find it one of those things that a cursory reading kind of lets people, gives people the wrong impression. But once you dig around in that a little bit, you realize just how fair and just and equitable it really is. And so many of our law ideas come from uh, uh, some kind of a system like this um, that, that it, it, makes, it makes a lot of sense. So let's go on. He, uh, he says, uh, verse 4, back to Joshua 21. Uh, and the lot came out for the families of the Kohathites and the children of Aaron the priest, which were the Levites. 
uh, had by lot out of the tribe of Judah, and out of the tribe of Simeon, and out of the tribe of Benjamin, thirteen cities. And the rest of the children of Kohath had by lot out of the cities, uh, the families of the tribe of Ephraim, and out of the tribe of Dan, and out of the half tribe of Manasseh, ten cities. And the children of Gershom had by lot of the families of the tribe of Issachar, and out of the tribe of Asher, and out of the tribe of Naphtali, and out of the half tribe of Manasseh, and Bashan, thirteen cities. The children of Merai, by their families, had out of the tribe of Reuben, and out of the tribe of Gad, and out of the tribe of Zebulun, twelve cities. Children of Israel gave by lot unto the Levites these cities with their suburbs, as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. Once again, I, I, I think it's important that we see that Joshua gave them their inheritance, and then he said, now out of that inheritance, you have to give to the Levites a certain amount of these cities. So they counted it all up, and they tried to scatter them and be equitable and fair with it, okay? Verse 9, they gave out of the tribe of the children of Judah, and out of the tribe of the children of Simeon, these cities, which were mentioned by name, which the children of Aaron, being of the family of the Kohathites, or of the children of Levi, had, for theirs was the first lot. And they gave them the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron. Now wait, I thought Caleb got Hebron. Well, he did, and then he turned around and gave it to the Levites. Because it says in the hill country of Judah, the suburbs thereof round about. But the fields of the city and the villages thereof gave that to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for his possession. Isn't that incredible? Caleb, the dog, the, the uh, uh, Kenizzite, who attached, his father attached himself to the Israelites, became one of the most faithful of those wilderness soldiers. He gets this inheritance. He goes to the inheritance. He has to whip the giants that are there in order to take the inheritance. And then at Shiloh, they say, now all of your inheritances give cities to the Levites. And Caleb says, I will gladly give the city of Hebron to the Levites. That is just, it's incredible. I mean, the guy's heart is amazing. Okay? And so, so he gets the inheritance. He gives his portion to the Levites. He gets the villages of that. So it says, Thus they gave the children of Aaron the priest Hebron with their suburbs to be a city of refuge for the slayer, and Libna with their suburbs, and Jatir with their suburbs, and Eshtimoah with their suburbs, and Holon with their suburbs, and Debir with their suburbs, and Ain with their suburbs, and Judah, Judah with their suburbs, and Beth Shemesh with their suburbs, nine cities out of those two tribes, and out of the tribe of Benjamin. And he goes on, and I'm going to allow you the incredible privilege of reading all those city names, but you've got, you've got the, the, the children of Levi by their families, the Kohathites, the Gershonites, each one of these different children of Levi, and they have each become these, these tribes, and so they're scattered through these areas, and so they, they divide them out through. Let's go back over to verse 41. All the cities of the Levites within the possession of the children of Israel were 48 cities, with their suburbs. These cities were every one with their suburbs round about them. Thus were all these cities. By the way, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> Book of Acts. I realize this is a long time after Joshua. Chapter 5. Uh, sorry, chapter 4. And it tells us it says, uh, verse 34, Acts 4, 34, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And the distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite and of the country of Cyprus, Having land sold it, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. How come does Barnabas, a Levite, have land at Cyprus? Why is he a Levite and he's from Cyprus? Why does he have land? I thought the Levites weren't supposed to own any land. Why does he live in Cyprus? We've got to remember what happened. So the, uh, uh, the Babylonian exile takes place. And all of the, well, first, the Assyrian invasion in the 700s B.C. takes place. And the northern tribes are all conquered. And they're intermarried. And this is where you get the Samaritans. But many of those Israelites were scattered. And then in the, the 600s and the 500s, you have the invasion of Judah. And the people are carted off to Babylon. After 70 years, the people return to Babylon, but not all. Because after that, you have Jews scattered all over the known world and 
They go to all of these different places. Some of them never returned to Jerusalem. Some of them returned and then uh, during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, things got really, really bad again. He was a Syrian uh, who conquered Jerusalem. He's the one who committed the abomination that causes desolation and slaughtered a pig on the altar and set up a statue of Juice, uh, Juice, <laughs> of Zeus in the, uh, uh, it's well calling Juice, uh, in the, uh, the, the, te- the temple setting. Uh, and during that time, many people scattered and, and fled. And so, so Barnabas is, is, a, is a Levite and he has kept up with his heritage through all of these years. He knows what tribe he comes from. But his family had moved to Cyprus. They just bugged completely out, got completely out of there. And to this day, um, you know, where the, the uh, tower collapsed in Florida, that is a huge Jewish community. So much so that the Israeli Defense Force sent soldiers to Florida to come, yeah, and clean that mess up. Have you all read that? Why? Why? Our IDF forces in the United States cleaning up a building that collapsed in Sunnyside, Florida. I don't know. Anyway, the the, the point being is is that is that they, these these cities of refuge and all of this this is going to function sort of and operate sort of until the time of the exile. After the time of the exile, Jewish people are scattered all over the world, um, even to this day. So. It says, these cities, verse 42 of Joshua 21, these cities were every one with their suburbs round about them. Thus were all these cities. And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land which he swore to give unto their fathers. And they possessed it and dwelt therein. Now this is, this is like I say, from here on down, we're going to wind down through the book of Joshua in the next few chapters. But this is, this is a statement, it's a, a really important statement. God told them, I'm going to give you that land. And we have now come to the point where God has given them that land. Uh, What God said hundreds of years before. God promised this to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and throughout the time in Egypt and throughout the time of the wilderness. And now here we are. And it says in verse 44, And the Lord gave them rest round about according to all that he sware unto their fathers. And there stood not a man of all their enemies before them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. All their enemies that they would fight. Because we've already talked about the fact that Manasseh and Dan and others, uh, the Jebusites, different groups, they just kind of quit. But they got, they got to a place where they, they found peace and rest. Like God had promised them. And so verse 45 says, There filled not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel all came to pass. What's that remind you of? When you read that, that last part there, what, what, does that remind you of anything? Rest. Kind of reminds me of Genesis. Kind of reminds me of the seventh day. And God saw all that he had created and it was good, right? And God rested on the seventh day. And it kind of sounds like that and it kind of reminds me of that. And, and so we, we sum up this chapter, these two chapters, with this statement. And, and I just want to encourage you tonight. You know, God carries through on his word. He carries through on his word. What God says, he does. And you can, you can count on that. You can, you can rest in that. You can trust that he's going to follow through on what he says. And uh, uh, this morning in my little devotional that I did this morning, the Lord just brought to mind Romans 8.31, and, and I just want to read it again. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? What an incredible verse of Scripture. What an, uh, just an, an overwhelming, it's one of those verses that you just, it's almost too good to be true. And it begs the question, am I on God's team or not? <laughs> you know, if I'm on God's team, that means God's for me. And, you know, I... I I, I just, I, I like to think about that time in the nation of Israel as they came to that place and many of the tribes, there, there were problems like we said, there were problems in Ephraim and Manasseh, places where they hadn't driven out all the enemies yet, Judah had the Jebusites and the Philistines and, and all of those kind of things, but they came to a place where they'd had war for seven years, now they came to a place of rest, they came to a place of plenty, they came to a place 
and, and I believe, I, I truly do, I believe had the people been faithful to God at that point, that they would have remained at a place of rest. They would have remained at a place of blessing. That's what he told them. But they just can't do it. They just, oh, they're just so captivated by the idols. They're so um, motivated by the flesh. They're so, um, they, they just, oh, they're just so greedy, you know. And it's going to go downhill very, very quickly from this point in time. But I want to encourage you, if God's for us, who can be against us? And I know this, if you're in Christ, God's for you. Amen? So you can rest in that. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for the word of God. Lord, we do pray for justice in our day. God, we live in a time where uh, evil is called good and good is called evil. And Lord, we just can't live like this. Thank you, Lord, for the people who are able to see clearly and who are working to correct these things. Help us, Lord, to be a part of that. Help us to be on your side and know that you're always on our side, that you're for us, Lord. Thank you for the lesson of the cities of refuge. Lord, may we uh, be just and equitable in our dealings. Um, Lord, may we uh, desire... Uh, for law to be our rule in this land. And uh, more importantly, Lord, thank you for the grace of Christ because we know that, that law can never save us. It can, it can manage the affairs of men, but it can never save us. Lord, only your grace, the grace that you poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ can save us. Help us, Lord, just to, to understand that grace a little bit better and share that grace with other people. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I love you. Glad you're here.